Okay, in this video, we're going to be doing eight AP Calculus BC multiple choice practice problems. So these are only BC material. None of this will be AB material. The problems come from the 2016-17 curriculum framework. Newer versions of that are called the Course and Exam Description, or the CED. Uh, and you can still definitely find this document online if you search it up. Let's take a look at the problems. Number one, the position of a particle moving in the xy plane is given by the parametric equations x of t is 6t over t plus 1, y of t is negative 8 over t squared plus 4. What is the slope of the line tangent to the path of the particle at the point where t equals 2? So my standard advice with this is to find y prime first and then find x prime because you're definitely just going to divide the first thing by the second thing. So uh, to find y prime, I'm first going to rewrite y um, to look like this. So just bring that denominator up to the negative first. I'm gonna chain rule this. So y prime is gonna be uh, positive eight t squared plus four to the negative second times two t. Now we have to find x prime. Uh, I'm just gonna use a quotient rule on this. So x prime of t is going to be, we got bottom derivative of the top minus, don't forget it's minus, top derivative of the bottom and then all over the bottom squared. So all over the bottom squared, t plus one, quantity squared. We have to evaluate both of these at two. So we will have y prime of two is gonna be, uh, you get eight times four, and then I'm bringing that back into the denominator. So four plus four squared. Uh, four plus four is eight. So you really have eight over eight squared, which is one over eight. And then uh, you have that times four. So four over eight is just one half. We have to find x prime of two. So x prime of two, uh, just sub in, right? You get three times six uh, minus two times six over three squared. 18 minus 12 is six, and then three squared is nine. So we have six over nine, which is two thirds. Now to find dy dx, we're just gonna do uh, y prime of two over x prime of two, which in this case is one half over two thirds, which is three fourths. So we are gonna box C. Number two, let y equal f of x be the solution to the differential equation dy dx equals one plus two y with the initial condition f of zero equals one. What is the approximation for f of one if Euler's method is used starting at x equals zero with a step size of 0.5? Okay, so Euler's method, we're gonna use a table every time. Let's set up our table. So we got this, x, y, and then this third column is gonna be our delta y. Delta y is approximately I always use f prime of x, y. It's not technically the right notation, but it's definitely okay or acceptable. Um, so delta y is approximately f prime of x, y delta x. Now what we need to do is fill in our given. So we know f of zero is one, so x starts at zero. Now think about it, the step size is gonna be 0.5, which means we can fill in the whole x column. We just have to go until we hit one. It's possible that on the exam, the delta x could be negative. Like you might know f of one and be asked about f of zero. Doesn't change the process at all, just use a delta x that's a negative. And then f of zero is one, so we fill in one here. Now we have to start calculating our approximate delta y's. I like to always start with the delta x, that is by far the most common thing that I see people leave out. So I'm gonna say it's one half. Now we take uh, x is zero and y is one and we plug them into dy dx. So uh, x is zero, x isn't a part of this, so it doesn't really matter. y is equal to one, so we'll do one plus two is three. So that's gonna be three halves. I like to use fractions on these. Some people like decimals, it's up to you. What we do to find our new y value is we take our old y value and our approximate delta y and we add them together. So this will be five halves. Repeat the process as many times as necessary. So delta x is one half. We have to do one plus two times five halves. So one plus five. So that'll be six. And then six over two is three. And I'm gonna add these together because I need to find this new y value. So five halves plus six halves is 11 halves. We don't have to do this for multiple choice, but on free response, you definitely then wanna say that f of one is approximately 11 halves, not equal to 11 halves, we're only approximating. And then uh, we will box our answer, which is D. Number three, for what value of k, if any, is the integral from zero to infinity of kx e to the negative two x dx equal to one? All right, so I look at this and I think immediately, this is an improper integral, so we have to use the correct notation. If this is open-ended, it's not, so it doesn't really matter, but I'm still gonna do it. Um, so that is, we have to use the limit as b approaches infinity, the integral from zero to b of kx e to the negative two x dx. We're gonna have to evaluate this, 
You look at that and you think, this is integration by parts. I'm gonna just factor the K out and not worry about it. So with integration by parts, you have to be able to take the derivative of U, but you take the derivative of anything. You also have to be able to integrate DV and that's a little harder. I am in this case going to make the choice of U is equal to X because the derivatives eventually go to zero. That's like the alternate plan. So I look at it and I say, can I integrate DV? I can. Um, if I can integrate both of them, then I would prefer to choose something where the derivatives go to zero because it means it's gonna terminate eventually. All right, so if u is equal to x, then uh, d is dx. If dv is e to the negative 2x dx, then v is gonna be negative 1 half e to the negative 2x. And now we're just gonna set this up. So k times the limit as b approaches infinity of uv, so that's gonna be negative 1 half x e to the negative 2x, minus, oh, also, this is a definite integral, so we're going from zero to b, minus the integral of uh, v du, right? So that's just negative one half e to the negative two x, and then dx. Uh, I'm gonna finish the integral and then deal with the bounds. I'm not gonna plug in yet. So uh, let's say we have k, still the limit. I'm gonna still leave this, but I'm gonna rewrite it a little bit. And then uh, the integral of negative, so it's minus the integral, negative one half and negative two x. All three of those negative signs are gonna be involved in this, uh, which means negative, negative, negative is a negative overall. So I'm gonna say it's minus, and then we just integrate. So you have negative one half uh, times negative one half because reversing the chain rule. And we're going from zero to b. So now I'm just gonna like, sub in b and sub in zero basically at this point. So we have this. I rewrote that e to the negative 2x as one over e to the 2x because it just makes life so much easier to figure out the limit to infinity. Um, so that's where that change came from. Now minus plug in zero and you get, you know, if x is zero, the first part is zero. And then you have, uh, so it'll be zero minus uh, one fourth e to the zero is one. This first part, the limit as b approaches infinity, because e to the two b is in the denominator, that's gonna dominate and this whole thing will just be zero. So really all that we have left is the one fourth that we get, because it's minus negative one fourth, and our k. And in the problem, the whole thing is supposed to equal one. So at this point, we just have k over four is equal to one, which means that k is definitely four. So we can box the answer c. Number four, the Taylor series for a function f about x equals zero converges to f for negative one to one. The nth degree Taylor polynomial for f about x equals zero is given by p n of x equals the sum from k equals one to n, negative one to the k, x to the k over k squared plus k plus one. Of the following, which is the smallest number m for which the alternating series error bound guarantees that the absolute value of f of one minus p four of one is less than or equal to m. This problem is a little confusing because it uses m in a context that we are probably not associating it with. I tend to think of m as the Lagrange error bound uh, kind of constant that we need to find. That's not the case here. Instead, m is just the error, right? Every time we run into this concept of like the actual thing minus the approximation, that's going to be our error. So uh, I do think this problem is easier to do than it is to think about. So let's see if we can find it. So first up, I notice that we're just plugging in one, right? So uh, at x equals one, we can kind of like rewrite our series uh, to just be uh, every x becomes one, but there's only one x, right? So it's just negative one to the k over k squared plus k plus one. Now, this is an error question about alternating series. So if we're using n equals four, that means that the error is gonna be at most so at most, it can be the first term left off, which would be when n is equal to five. So I think to solve this problem, we just have to plug n equals five into our series above. So if n is equal to five, what do we get? What's that term? So when n is five, we get negative one to the fifth over five squared plus five plus one. We actually need the absolute value of this because it's error. Um, and then if we just evaluate this, we get one over 31. So I think the answer is C. I actually think there's an alternate approach where you just start plugging in values, right? So K equals one, two, three, four, five. Since we're only going up to four, according to the problem, we just kind of like draw a little boundary there. The first term left off will be our error, which again gives us C. 
five. Selected values of a function f and its first three derivatives are indicated in the table above. What is the third degree Taylor polynomial for f about x equals one? First up, you look at it and you're like, about x equals one? That's really important. It means that the polynomial will always have quantity x minus one, which means a cannot be the answer. But then I notice something, I'm like, well, a is probably a distractor, which means if you look at these, those are probably the actual coefficients, which makes me think that b is going to be the answer. I'm gonna do the problem anyway because it would be silly to answer based on that, but I think the answer is gonna end up b. All right, now what we need to do is write our polynomial, right? So our polynomial is gonna follow a pattern. It's gonna be the nth derivative over n factorial x minus one to the n. That's gonna be like each term as we go through. So I'm gonna highlight this row in the table and then just to make things a little easier to follow, I'm gonna color code these numbers. Um, so that's our, our value, our first, second, and third derivatives. Uh, so let's go. It's the value of the function plus first derivative over one factorial x minus one to the first. Then it'll be plus second derivative over two factorial x minus one to the second. Then it'll be plus third derivative over three factorial, x minus one to the third. Now we just have to simplify these to get our final answer. Um, so you can just go through. Uh, one factorial is one, two factorial is two, three factorial is six. So we'll simplify all of those coefficients. And we look at it and we do in fact get B as our answer. So we select it. Uh, I don't really know what's going on as C with C as an answer choice, but D is definitely, if you forgot the n factorial in the denominator part, anyway, our answer is definitely B. Six, which of the following statements about the series, the sum from one to infinity, negative one to the n over one plus root n is true. All right, so first we got to figure out if this thing converges absolutely, which was, is kind of the dream when you're dealing with these sorts of things. So we're gonna take the absolute value of the n term that's gonna give us the series one over one plus root n. You might have the sense that that diverges. It definitely does. If we needed to do work, uh, what I would do is a limit compare with just one over root n, a p series that diverges. So we're gonna do uh, you know, the, the given over the one that we're comparing it to. That's gonna give us the limit as n approaches infinity, root n over one plus root n. That limit is definitely one which means both series do the same thing, and in this case, they diverge. So the absolute value of the terms doesn't give you a convergent series, so it's not absolutely convergent. So now we just have to decide, does this thing converge at all, really? Option C says the series converges, but neither conditionally nor absolutely. That's not really a part of AP calculus, um, so I'm not sure what scenario they would give you where that could be our answer. Um, but let's take a look at the actual alternating series, right? So. We're applying the alternating series test, uh, definitely alternates. Uh, the terms definitely decrease in magnitude because the numerator is actually just one, right? After you take the absolute value, you just get one over something that's growing. That's definitely gonna decrease. And then if we take the limit to infinity, you're definitely gonna get zero. Those are the criteria for convergence by alternating series test. So it does converge when it alternates, which means it's conditionally convergent. So if the blue text that we wrote had been convergent, then it would converge absolutely. As soon as that didn't happen, our only option is really conditionally, we got converges and therefore conditionally. So our answer is going to be B. Seven, at time t greater than or equal to zero, particle moving in the xy plane has velocity vector given by v of t equals four e to the negative t comma sine of quantity one plus root t what is the total distance the particle travels between t equals one and t equals three? This is definitely going to be a calculator problem. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna find the arc length, right? So parametric arc length is distance traveled when you have something moving according to parametric equations. We're given velocity, so we don't have to take any derivatives. We're just gonna find arc length using this velocity function. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to the calculator. I'm gonna type it all in and come back and box the answer.
based on all of that, we can see that the answer is A. 8 for x greater than or equal to 1, the continuous function g is decreasing and positive. So positive continuous decreasing, so we can use the integral test. A portion of the graph of g is shown above. For n greater than or equal to 1, the nth term of the series from 1 to infinity a sub n is defined by a sub n equals g of n. If the integral from 1 to infinity of g of x dx converges to 8, which of the following could be true? All right, so first up, if this converges, then we know that the series also converges, so d cannot possibly be the answer. Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw some rectangles. So I'm going to draw rectangles starting from 1 going forward. These are left ream on sum. So if we look at this, every one of those rectangles is bigger, and if the integral itself gives you 8, then the sum of those rectangles has to be bigger than 8. The only answer that we could have here is c. All right, that was eight really good questions that are going to help you out on the BC calculus exam. I hope this was helpful, and good luck.